We're getting a tad bit of a delayed start this morning to our work for the day. I was trying to get all of our ducks in a row and then realized I didn't even have the ducks I needed. So I had to make a few trips. Now we're headed out to the farm to do some work. Let's see how painful fuel prices are this morning. 460 for gas, 444 for diesel fuel. That's depressing. We're only an hour late. With the exception of the pink water bottle, here's all of our supplies for the project we're about to embark on. Definitely can't forget to mention the Canada CBD pouches. Use code DOLE, D-O-L-E, for 20% off. The backpack is actually the most crucial part of this project because we're going to be inside of our south 48-foot grain bin right there. And getting all this stuff inside is actually quite a bit of a challenge. I only have so many hands. I wish I had more. I feel like I'm Dora the Explorer about to go on some kind of a quest. Since the last video, we have emptied both of our harvest stores here. Had about 6,500 bushel on this one and 7,500 in this one. So I was a little bit heavy when I mentioned 15,000 bushels total. This is what the inside of a harvest store looks like. This concrete floor is exactly why it's not good for long-term storage. And that's why we got it empty. No aeration through the bottom. The corn will go off grade very quickly. And these walls also tend to sweat, which is not good for maintaining corn quality. I'm gonna see if I can make my way up that ladder without losing anything. The backpack works surprisingly well. I thought something was gonna go wrong, but it went smooth. Although I'm not sure if the bins have gotten taller or I'm in worse shape because I'm actually out of breath quite a bit. I'm sure you guys could guess what the answer to that is. That right there is exhibit A of what our problem is. We've dealt with this for a few years, pigeons, have busted in through all of our roof vents. There's normally a screen keeping them out, but they've kind of taken up home in this 48 foot grain bin. It's almost as if they enjoy having 40,000 bushels of corn to eat all winter. I'm going to close this off for good. A quick note about grain bin safety before we get started. These are not something that should be taken lightly on the inside. Unfortunately, they've claimed a lot of lives from moving grain and trapping people who are on the inside. You need to take very specific safety considerations when you're inside. If you're unsure about the quality of the grain, the foundation underneath you, you should be strapped up. I'm not worried right here in this bin. It was dry corn when we put it in 15%. It was filled to the brim and it's not exerting any kind of signs of issues. We've also only pulled grain from the middle sump, meaning the only grain is exited down that way. Now, I'm not even gonna risk going over the middle there because that is obviously a more problematic area, but what typically happens is a bridge forms underneath, usually from wet grain. Someone comes in here a lot of times with the sumps running, which they should never be. Uh, grain collapses underneath, swallows them whole. The weight of the grain encumbering around them traps them in. Just to be safe, staying up on the outside, and my Uncle Chris is on the outside, so if I yell, hopefully he can save me. The winged rats are even laying eggs in here at this point. They may have a claim for adverse possession. Been here for way too long. They're disgusting. It's time to shut them out. And here's how we do so. We gotta fix all these screens, which they have found out how to push open. Not that they're really super secure. Some of these I'm gonna have to use my own wire. Other ones I'll be able to just bolt these ones in. Gonna go around and secure those down a little bit more and it should not give the pigeons any ability to pop these open. That's pretty much the gist of it. Now I just gotta go around and secure all the ones that are loose. Keep the pigeons out, should hold. Part of the reason that we're doing it while there's grain in the bin is because we essentially have something to stand on. We've talked about fixing this numerous times over the years, but we end up hauling the grain out and there's nothing to stand on. Now we actually have some solid footing. So I'm gonna get to it. Now, by no means am I saying that it's impenetrable that the pigeons can't get back in, but I will say that if they do, they'll have earned the right to stay here for another season because these things are cinched down pretty good. I can already hear those rapscallions on the roof planning their entry back into the feed store and their house. They all left peacefully though. There's not a single one left in the bin. 
surprised. While I sit here and drum up the motivation to pack up my bag and head back down the ladder, I will give you the quick and dirty on what happened to my two fingertips because I know it's killing a lot of you to know. No, it did not happen on the farm. Over the new year, I went with Allie and her family to Orlando to enjoy some warm weather, get away from the farm and the crappy weather we've had here. In the hotel room, I went to open a double hung window, so a window that has a front pane on the bottom and a back pane higher up. I pushed it down with my right hand and my left hand, I undid that middle lock. And when I did that, the top one, unbeknownst to me, had no tension against it, which I've never dealt with a double hung window that did not have tension or resistance. And it just came down like a guillotine on these two fingertips. Now, they weren't cut off by any means, but they were completely blown open. Had to go to the emergency room, have multiple stitches, came home a week later from the vacation, had to have corrective surgery, get my bones repaired because both fingertips were broken. And it's been about a two month process of healing. Every two weeks going for x-rays, doctor checkups. And as a matter of fact, just yesterday, I was cleared to go back to light labor with these two fingers. It's one of those deals where very unfortunate that it happened. It's kind of ironic that I work on a farm all my life and I never do anything to my fingers, but the minute I go on vacation, I injure myself. That being said, not fun not having access to two of the fingers that are very important on your dominant hand. So hopefully that doesn't happen again and everything heals back up. Uh, I keep the bandages on at this point for your sake and everyone else's sake because they don't look pretty. Uh, one of my fingertips looks like it's been smashed with a hammer. Uh, I got a nail on it, but it's not attached at all. And my other fingertip, uh, no fingernail on it and scabbed up and doesn't look that great. So uh, that's the 10-4 on that one. Is that an eagle? With the turkey vultures? Oh, it is. That's a, that's like a prepubescent eagle. Rocky road color. The two turkey vultures are like, get a load of this guy, thinks he's all cool. Look how big he is. Yep, that's an eagle. Just hasn't gotten his colors yet. Wow. I had some lofty ambitions going into this winter with projects that had accrued over the growing season that I was just gonna catch up on and some other stuff I was gonna upgrade. And then I went to Disney World and smashed my two fingers in a window and here we are, first week of March, just finally getting started on things that should have been done two months ago. I'm trying to knock a lot out today, and to be frank, I don't really want to haul grain, so finding other things to do. And here we are at our next project. Now someone, not to point fingers at anyone, particularly the person who runs the soybean planter in the spring, which is totally not me, ran over this white inlet and snapped it off. Unlike our orange ones on the other two terraces, this is a one piece going all the way down to the tile in the ground. I would imagine at one point in time, those two were also like this, but got ran over by someone else who wasn't me. That was before my time. We need to come in here, measure it. We need to put a sleeve or a female receptacle, throw away that white one and get another orange inlet to put in here. That way we can remove it if we run it over, which is likely to happen again. I'm sure you can now see our predicament. See how wide this thing is. Got six inches. Yeah, six inches wide. If it hadn't rained two inches two days ago, Dean Drainage would probably be out here laying this 24 inch tile line for us. Hopefully they get it in before this crop because we've been waiting since last fall. Albeit it was last minute and turned off wet. They're about as limited as we are in terms of field working capacity and capability. If it's too wet, they just can't go. Dean's place is coincidentally where we needed to go for our tile hardware anyways, so. Two birds with one stone, we can check in on that project. Well, it took about a half second to get what I needed and he did confirm that if it hadn't rained, he would in fact have been laying that tile this week, which is unfortunate, but maybe next week? Seems to be the story of this year so far, this winter. Wait, 474. Wasn't that cheaper this morning? Like by 25 or 30 cents? It definitely was. That's ridiculous. Pretty simple job. Clean out around the bottom of it. Cut it off where I think it needs to be, attach our piece, screw it in so it doesn't go anywhere, put in the new one, profit. Now if only we can get it done as quickly or as simply as that just sounded. Secure. 
I don't think it's going to go anywhere, but here is the moment of truth. I'll do the job. Look at that. It's like nothing ever happened. I will say that it looks like our terraces need a little bit of reshaping from all this water. You can see that there's still a lot sitting in the terrace bottoms, which is probably somewhat unavoidable, but you just get so much dirt movement, silt comes off the top moves it settles and it just messes the grade up on everything that's fixed for now though the ground was a little bit muddier than i was planning on dealing with but gotta work with what you have given this ridiculous jump in fuel prices it may be time to trade the fleet of deer in for some horses no forget that we definitely need these to get the work done if i had to make a rough guesstimation on how much fuel we use an acre i'd say five six maybe seven gallons of diesel fuel between all of our tractors our combines everything from a to z on our farm now that being said if you add a dollar or two dollars to our price you're looking at five to ten twelve fifteen dollars let's say given where commodity prices are right now and our average yields we pull in it's really not going to make or break our operation. Now, if you're working with tight margins, it's certainly not going to help, but nothing really to scoff at, although no one likes to pay for more fuel. These added fuel costs, though, are going to change the way some people manage their operations. It's going to favor less tillage or more efficient tillage, like a strip till for fertilizer. Some people already use something with that much precision. But whatever you can do to get across the most ground using the least amount of fuel. Now, there's pros and cons to everything. Typically with tillage, you use more fuel, you use less herbicides. On the back side of things, herbicides are also sky high in price. Really where it's gonna hurt us and nearly everyone, non-farmers included across every industry, is gonna be on the logistical side of things. It's just painful to fill up your everyday driver, you know, your pickup truck, your car, whether it's twice a week, once a week, once every two weeks. We don't like to do it. I know you don't like to do it, especially at these prices, and it just becomes more and more painful as this goes on. I saw a set of statistics courtesy of the Illinois Farm Bureau that actually is scary on the input side. Russia and its allies account for 40% of the world's potash production, 20 plus percent of the world's anhydrous ammonia production, 16% of the world's urea, and then of course crude and natural gas, so energy is used to make those fertilizers. I mean, this is not gonna be good. We already thought that inputs were gonna be expensive this next year. If you're not locked in now, you may consider doing so, but 2023 is gonna be a pretty expensive year. Uh, for those of you who say, well, you got a lot of money to work with. No, actually, these things catch up pretty quick. We usually get one year where we can make a pretty substantial profit and then people like to stick their hand in the cookie jar, so to speak, fertilizer prices jump up pretty high and everything else goes with it. Much like all of you probably, I would really like to have a crystal ball and be able to tell what the future holds. When the dust settles from all this chaos, the world may not be the same as it was beforehand. Regardless, that's more than enough farming for one video. I appreciate you all tuning in. Spring is right around the corner. We'll be getting all this stuff out, doing some servicing. Everyone, make sure you like the video, subscribe if you want to see more, and comment down below if you have any questions. You know I love to talk about farming. Have a great day, everyone. Peace!